I'm thrilled to be tr uh, sandwiched between the transition of Walter and Vanessa, two of the fabulous people in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, wonderful professors, uh, wonderful colleagues. And I just wanted to start and say, when we talk about transitions, um, as you all know, Walter has done an amazing job leading the Humanities Center and providing respite to faculty for decades um, to take a break from their department home, to find a new home, to find new creativity, and to focus. And I think that in higher ed, you know, semester after semester, you're signing up to teach a year ahead of time, and there's like no breaks, and it becomes very routine um, to have the gift of the Humanity Center and the ability to have these create the space to have these conversations, um, and also to have an office elsewhere is an amazing model and an amazing opportunity for the faculty at Wayne State. And that transition helps your, your scholarship sort of thrive. And it's one of the reasons I continue to do research because I, you know, I, I think I'm a healthier person <laughs> than focusing on one thing. So Walter, thank you so much for your leadership. And with that in mind, I, I, Vanessa's involved with and our humanities professors and Walter, I think you know this, we're trying to create a humanities common um, on the second floor of the undergraduate library. We have a very large and active STEM common in the college. Um, and for equivalency sake, I've been working for a couple of years trying to find nice space where students in the humanities can get together and have uh, group work projects, do podcasts, uh, do all sorts of humanity things, have professors um, assign them to go over there and do activities. There's some small breakout rooms. So we're on the, um, we're in the planning processes of that. But um, Vanessa, we met Monday of this week. And we're going to be getting quotes around furniture and things like that. But that's for students and to sort of uplift the humanities um, that are so important. And that we're so lucky to be studying the humanities in Detroit in the Museum and Cultural District. Uh, I think it's probably the best place in the world. And that's why I'm a little saddened that we're not in person. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the Detroit, with everything that we have to offer, um, I think that, that, that we really are emerging in this area. And we owe Walter a great debt of gratitude. Uh, so also, I wanted to just um, thank our keynote speaker, Dr. Jian from Harvard University. I love the title of your talk. I know you're going to be talking about poetry, but I find when I get out of work, particularly starting this time of year, I, you know, change my clothes, go for a run and take care of my garden. Um, and that, <laughs> that helps me stay, stay sane. My research is actually on life course transitions. So I, I've worked with folks coming out of total institutions or into the community in some kind of transition. Uh, uh, and I think it's, it's part of the human spirit and part of resiliency. So I think that you're gonna have wonderful discussions today. I thank all the presenters for taking the time to be here. I do hope that you're able to take a break and get up and get some water from Zoom um, and then come back refreshed at a certain point. I'm sure Vanessa will build that into her moderation. <laughs> Um, but just have a wonderful time. And, I'm, I, you know, next year, let's do it in person, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Steffi and Walter. And I want to thank all the panelists for their participation today. And, and thank you, the audience, for joining us today. We have a, a wonderful large audience today and very excited uh, to see everybody here. Um, my name is Vanessa DeGiffis. I'll be moderating our uh, first panel here. I am uh, the chair of the Department of Classical and Modern Languages, Literatures and Cultures at Wayne State University. And it's a real pleasure for me to be able to moderate this panel today. Excuse me. Uh, uh, what we'll be doing is, you know, we have uh, one, two, three, four presenters. Uh, we have Alina Cherry, uh, Associate Professor in CMLLC, which is my department, uh, who will be presenting a, a paper, Beyond Catastrophe, Transitioning Through Pictures and Words in Laurent Mauvignes Around the World. We have Lisa O'Donnell, Assistant Professor in Social Work at Wayne State, presenting a paper entitled A Feasibility Pilot Study Assessing Attitudes on the Treatment of Mood and Anxiety Disorders Among Individuals in the Workplace. We have Yun Shuang Zhang from uh, CMLLC, Assistant Professor of Chinese Literature, who will be presenting Spatial and Cultural Transitions, The Rise of the Private 
studio. And then we have Margaret Hull, assistant professor in art and art history at Wayne State, presenting Cottage Core Chintz and Persistence Through a Duke Colonial Lens. Um, for each speaker, I will be presenting a little longer introduction and description of a brief professional biography for each speaker before they present. Then they will be presenting for about 25 minutes or so. And then we'll have a 10 minute Q&A after each paper before moving on to the next speaker. Um, and um, so participants who'd like to ask questions, please feel free to use the chat function. Um, and there's also in the reactions uh, uh, tab in Zoom, you can use a little electronic hand raise if you'd like to uh, participate that way. I apologize in advance if I go out of order uh, and miss some people. Um, I also apologize if I um, cannot read a Chinese script. I know some of the participants' names uh, in the list and in the chat will be in a script I cannot read, and I'm sorry I won't be able to, to identify those individuals by name. Um, but uh, yeah, I look forward to, uh, to uh, the participation of the audience. And uh, without further ado, I will introduce the first speaker today, who is uh, Alina Cherry. She's Associate Professor of French in the Classical and Modern Language department at Wayne State. Um, she's uh, she received her PhD from New York University in 2009. Some of her current research and teaching interests include contemporary French and Francophone fiction, mobilities studies, geocriticism, and space and place. Her book, Claude Simon, Fashioning the Past by Writing the Present, was published in 2016 by Farley Dickinson University Press. Thank you, Alina. Her paper is entitled Beyond Catastrophe, Transitioning Through Pictures and Words in Laurent Mauvignes Around the World. Alina? Thank you very much, Vanessa. And uh, thank you, Walter and Steffi. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm super excited to share uh, some of my research uh, in uh, somewhat rough form today. Um, the I'm going to actually share a PowerPoint with you. OK, so I propose today to look at the depiction of catastrophe and its impact on a globalized and interconnected world through the lens of the novel Autour du Monde, Around the World, uh, published in 2014 by French author Laurent Mauvigné. Around the World is a composite novel that brings together 14 individual stories of varying length, each featuring different characters who live in um, various parts of the world. According to the summary that appears on the back cover of the novel, the common thread connecting these disparate stories is the tsunami triggered by the Great East Japan earthquake that occurred on March 11, 2011, off the northeastern coast of Japan. The 9.0 magnitude earthquake was the third most violent earthquake ever recorded. According to the World Health Organization, the earthquake was so powerful that it moved Honshu, Japan's largest island, 2.4 meters east and shifted the earth on its axis by an estimated 10 to 25 centimeters. Yet, it wasn't the earthquake, but the tsunami that followed that devastated the coastal areas of Tohoku and Southern Hokkaido and claimed the majority of the approximately 20,000 lives lost. We recall that the tsunami caused the cooling system failure at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, which resulted in a level seven nuclear meltdown and release of radioactive materials. The electrical power and backup generators were overwhelmed by the tsunami and the plant lost its cooling capabilities. It's worth noting that the nuclear catastrophe it is still unfolding in Japan as people are displaced and areas contaminated by radioactivity cannot yet be reclaimed. Around the world is part of a growing wave of contemporary literary works that address the ways in which human beings relate to one another in an increasingly globalized society. These works, among which we can count Emmanuel Carrère's Lives Other Than My Own, published in 2010, 
Annie Arnaud's Look at the Lights, My Love, published in 2014, and Mélis de Carangal's Men the Living, also published in 2014, highlight the various attachments, both visible and invisible, we develop among ourselves as inhabitants of a highly interconnected world. Around the World stands out as a compelling example because it foregrounds the importance of human interdependency through its very form, thus shedding light on the crucial intersection of ethics and poetics. As a composite novel that joins together 14 distinct stories and 22 different characters through the theme of catastrophe, Around the World emphasizes at once autonomy. The stories uh, constitute coherent wholes by themselves and could be read independently of one another, and interdependence, uh, because taken holistically, the novel delivers a much more powerful message about the impact of catastrophes on humanity. Moreover, the transitions between the different stories also highlight the complex structure of the novel as they are performed in transmedial fashion through words as well as pictures. Both the structure of the novel and the transitions between the stories raise questions of relatedness. How do we relate to one another in everyday circumstances, but also in times of catastrophe? Are all lives equally affected by disaster? What role do indirect forms of witnessing, such as listening to or watching the news, have on the perception of catastrophe? How does geographical proximity to a disaster affect those involved? Does effective proximity have the same impact? The 14 separate stories that make up the novel take place respectively in Japan, on a cruise ship traveling in the North Sea, in the Bahamas, in Jerusalem, Moscow, Dubai, on a plane somewhere between Montreal and Niagara, on an African safari, in London, in Rome, in the Gulf of Aden, in Italy, in Thailand and Des Moines, in Florida, and finally in Paris. The tsunami is only prominent in the first and last story, and in the latter in a very particular way as a taboo, an unspoken event that is hidden from one of the characters. However, in almost all of the other stories, the disaster in Japan surfaces in some form or another. I say almost because despite what the back cover claims, the tsunami does not appear in every story. This absence is significant insofar as it shifts the focus from a particular disaster, in this case, the earthquake and tsunami in Japan, to the idea of disaster more generally. Indeed, in every story, including those from which the tsunami is absent, there is some kind of disaster happening, whether on a smaller individual scale, such as the disappearance of a beloved dog or the takeover by sea pirates of a small private vessel in the Gulf of Aden, or on a large collective scale, as the novel is haunted by the echoes of two past collective disasters, the Holocaust and Hurricane Katrina. The story that highlights most prominently the superposition of disasters features Luli, a young woman from Chile who travels to Jerusalem on March 10, 2011, the day before the disaster. She's searching for her own past via the traces left by her grandmother, a Polish woman of Jewish origin, who lost her entire family during the Second World War. Having arrived at the airport, Luli is surprised to, find, to see that the person who was supposed to pick her up didn't show. It is only a day later when she goes to visit this person, a cousin whom she managed to locate after a long search, that she learns the, reasons for, the reason for her absence. She was the victim of a terrorist attack that occurred at the airport as Luli was getting off the plane. This individual catastrophe is thus inscribed in the larger frame of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but it also problematizes through the history of Luli's family, the responsibility for the Jewish genocide. The disaster in Japan serves as a backdrop to these other catastrophic events, prompting Luli to wonder as she watches the television images flash before her, what shocks her more, the terrible events lived that day in person or the cataclysm witnessed on TV? In contrast to Luli's narrative, the first story of the novel takes place in Japan and narrates the brief love encounter between a Mexican youth named Guillermo and Yuko, a Japanese woman. It is the only story that describes in great detail the earthquake and the arrival of the gigantic wave that destroyed and swept away everything in its path. 
In the last story, a Japanese family vacationing in Paris is equally affected by the calamity, despite the physical distance that separates them from their home country. The protection afforded by this geographical distance is canceled by their emotional proximity with the victims, the affective and psychological attachment to places and people, friends and family left behind. The story is particularly moving as it is told through the perspective of an eight-year-old girl, Fumi, whose efforts to contact her grandmother in Japan are methodically postponed by her parents who are trying to hide from her the news of the disaster that completely obliterated her grandparents' village. In the other stories of the novel, the Japanese tragedy is no longer the central element, but a news item that one becomes acquainted with by watching TV or listening to the radio. Even in this mediated form, it functions as a powerful background against which other catastrophes, both individual and collective, play out, heightening the sense of responsibility the characters feel when faced with these events. Displayed is, a sort, is an assortment of reactions ranging from passive indifference to sheer astonishment, from emotional distress to trauma. I'd like to argue that Mauvigné plays with the concepts of physical distance and proximity to highlight the degree of interdependency that defines our contemporary society. Geographical distance as a protective buffer zone has been rendered ineffective by the ubiquity of images and the media. Thus, the concept of the network becomes a very powerful one, first in relation to the pervasiveness of the news story, and second, in relation to how we experience our place and role in the world as part of a human network. It is no wonder that the numerous characters in the novel fade behind their multiple movements and journeys, giving the impression that their function is not to assert themselves as individualities, but to highlight the myriad interpersonal connections that are formed thanks to the larger globalized systems of transportation and communication. It is clear by now that the concept of catastrophe is thematically at the core of Mauvigny's novel. And yet, structurally, the novel has no core. It can, be best, it can best be described as acentered, multiplicitous, heterogeneous, and non-hierarchical. In this respect, it is reminiscent of the concept of the rhizome as proposed by Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari in their seminal work, A Thousand Plateaus. Originating in botany and introduced into the world of theory by the psychologist Carl Jung, the rhizome becomes a widely used conceptual tool by way of the works of Deleuze and Guattari, who employ it as a counter image to the tree. As exemplified by Chomsky's grammatical trees in linguistics, but also by the fields of psychology, biology, and human organization, modeled as hierarchical or binary systems, the tree is the dominant ontological model in Western thought. Deleuze and Guattari developed the concept of the rhizome through an analysis of the book. And it's actually the book that they're writing together, A Thousand Plateaus, that they use as an example of this. So they developed the concept of the rhizome through an analysis of the book and in contrast with the tr tree image. And much about the rhizome can be understood through this opposition between the rhizome and the tree. The tree represents a hierarchy, and it also references a binary system because every branch ties back to the root that makes growth possible. Deleuze and Guattari argue that a first type of book is the root book, which follows the model of the tree. I quote, this is the classical book as noble signifying. The book imitates the world as art imitates nature. The law of the book is the law of reflection, the one that becomes two, end quote. The second figure of the book they present is the radical system or fascicular root. I quote, this time the principal root has aborted or its tip has been destroyed. An immediate indefinite multiplicity of secondary roots grafts onto it and undergoes a flourishing development. I'd like to propose that around the world is such a book. And I'd like to support this claim by illustrating how three of the chief principles of the rhizome as posited by Deleuze and Guattari, structure the functioning of the novel. The first principle in question is the principle of connection and heterogeneity. I quote, any point of a rhizome can be connected to, another, to anything other and must be. This is very different from the tree or root which plots a point fixes an order, end quote. 
The way in which the 14 heterogeneous stories connect in the novel, other than through the overarching theme of catastrophe and its variations, is through specific words. For instance, the word quietude appears at the end of one story and reappears at the very beginning of the following story, thus ensuring an almost imperceptible transition. Sometimes a location seen on TV by a character becomes the main setting for another story. Mauvignet's writing reveals the complex poetics of connectivity that evades the arborescent schema insofar as it designates a structure consolidated around the central unit. The second principle is the principle of multiplicity, which is uh, illustrated in Mauvignet by the variety of stories, locations, and characters portrayed. The third principle is the principle of a, a signifying rupture, which posits that, I quote, a rhizome may be broken, shattered at a given spot, but it will start up again on one of its old lines or new lines, end quote. This is precisely what happens between Mauvignet's stories as it is not always possible linguistically to determine where a story ends and another begins. A new story may start with the same word that ended the previous story and continue in a completely different direction following a separate line of thought. More often than not, there is no punctuation such as a period or typographic signs such as a new paragraph to demarcate the break between um, the stories. It's valuable to understand the rhizomatic functioning of the novel because it sheds new light on the questions of relatedness that we posed at the beginning of the talk. I should note that Edouard Glissant uses the deleuze quatorian concept as a cornerstone in developing his poetics of relation. He writes, I quote, rhizomatic thought is the principle behind what I call the poetics of relation in which each and every identity is extended through a relationship with the other, end quote. As one character puts it in Mauvignet's novel, referring to the humanitarian crisis in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, I quote, this concerns us all, okay? What happens to others also concerns us. We are all concerned, end quote. It is no coincidence that most of Mauvignet's characters are traveling or are constantly on the move. Never at home, they inhabit the world, suggesting that it is no longer possible to live in isolation, separated from others, and that our current home is the planet, which we have to protect. The book thus delivers a powerful message about the human, emotional, psychological, and socioeconomic toll of catastrophe, about the dangers of ecologic disasters, and about the interconnectedness of the living world. The message is all the more compelling as it doesn't embrace the form of an ideological discourse, but stems from and is supported by the structure of the book. An important element of this structure, which I have yet to discuss in detail, is the manner in which the transitions between the separate stories are effected. The etymology of the word transition, originating in the Latin transitionem, which signifies a going across or over, points to the inherent mutability of the concept. A transition can be understood as change, movement, or passage from one position, state, subject, etc., to another. It thus translates a fluctuating in between state, space, or period. As I had briefly noted, the transitions between the stories in the novel are performed in transmedial fashion through both words and picture, pictures. And I'm going to show a couple of examples. Um, so in the first example, the word tourist, and I'm sorry, the, it's, the text is in French. I did not have a translation. Actually, it hasn't been translated. Um, so we can see that the word tourist, it's right here before the, uh, the picture that's inserted and then you have tourists. So uh, this is very helpful because um, we also have the break uh, that's produced, uh, the break in the text that's produced by the insertion of the picture. So the transition is made through this uh, play on the word tourist that operates the, 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 the connection between the two stories. The picture is inserted right where the textual break occurs. And I have a second example. Uh, in this one, the picture is inserted right where the, uh, the, the picture marks the break between two different stories. So there is no linguistic transition. One story ends, you have the picture, and then another story begins. And uh, I should note here that the pictures, um, the photographs are not selected 
uh, haphazardly, they're actually connected to uh, elements of the story they precede. So here in the following story, um, they, the story is about a projected trip to a casino. So we have an image that, that's connect, connected to that. Um, the other pictures, I don't have pictures, of, I don't have photographs of all of them, but they usually portray um, landscapes, exotic, luxuriant uh, landscapes, seascapes, and uh, easily recognizable places of cities, like the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem and the old city of Jerusalem, um, the Red Square in Moscow, um, the Burj Khalifa Tower in Dubai. So. Uh, some touristic um, places that are easily recognizable. In the third example, uh, the linguistic transition has already occurred on the previous page. So here, the picture actually lags behind, and this is the case with several stories. So the transition has already happened, and a few paragraphs down, um, you have the, in the, the picture inserted. This dual mode of shifting via words and images from one story to another has divergent effects on the reader. The linguistic transitions are very subtle, emphasizing cohesion and fluidity. Movinia uses thematic similarities, the ambiguity of personal pronouns and wordplay to create seamless transitions that are difficult to detect. As a result, the reader is not necessarily aware that she's already reading another story uh, until the storyline changes a new character emerges or a picture interrupts the flow of the text. The impulse of the reader is to retrace her steps in order to find the exact point of junction between the stories so as to gain a better grasp of the narrative. Thus, the reading experience describes a forward motion followed by a backward one, a dual movement that actually mimics the advancing and retreating actions of the wave, which constitutes a central thematic element in the novel. It starts with the tsunami, the killer wave. On the other hand, the insertion of photographs, which belong to a different medium, creates obvious breaks in the text, emphasizing discontinuity. The presence of the pictures surrounded by blank space makes us pause and ponder their role. The blank space offers a moment of linguistic silence in a work wherein silence is a relevant theme in the context of catastrophe. Hence, the transitions fulfill multiple functions. They stress the duality of the novel, which foregrounds at once continuity and discontinuity, while drawing our attention to the movement of the wave, a chief thematic element, and honoring the victims through a minute of contemplative silence. Both the linguistic borders, which are quite porous, and the pictures, which clearly indicate that we have entered a new story, reveal a text in a continual state of becoming, as the end of one story generates the beginning of another one fueling through these transitions, the very progression of the novel. Hence, the organization of the novel simultaneously foregrounds autonomy and interdependence, pointing to our individual and collective existence. The fact that the novel is held together by transitions that also ensure its progression shows that Mauvigny is interested not only in narrating catastrophic events, but in moving beyond catastrophe, as the title of my, art, of my paper suggests, inviting us to envision a post-disaster world in which both, individual and both the individual and collective dimensions, as well as the private and public spaces are equally valued and preserved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alina. That was a very illuminating paper. Uh, yes, cheers and applause. <laughs> Uh, so again, uh, questions are welcomed in the chat or by using the little electronic hand raise in the reactions tab of Zoom. Uh, so uh, um, while I wait to see if any uh, participants in the audience would like to ask questions, um, may I ask Alina, um, uh, oh, Steffi, is that your hand? You can go first. 
Okay. Yeah, I was just going to ask, um, uh, you know, with the theme of transitions, what would you say in in, a, in an elevator, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 seconds, uh, would you say is the, the main takeaway of your paper in terms of its, uh, uh, how it illuminates the theme of transition and why, why transition matters? Um, well, that's a, a very, uh, complex question uh, for a 30 minute, uh, 30 second answer. But uh, I would say that the transitions really, um, they, they emphasize the state, uh, our living conditions that we are, we, we have individual lives. So we were separate from others, but yet we're all concerned, we're all connected. Um, living in a globalized world where everything is connected and we have seen with the pandemic, right? Um, this talk is part of is it's going to be an article that's part of a book and in the book I also look at other catastrophes and the other one is the earthquake in Haiti, but also the pandemic. And I think the pandemic is the one that really uh, showed us that you know we are all concerned because it became global so it moved and in the past, this would have been harder to happen, it would have been more difficult to happen, because the conditions weren't there we didn't have the same uh, fast travel. Um, we weren't so connected. So I think the transitions, I, I really like how this novel, um, you know, through its very form shows how uh, connected we are and yet we exist as individuals, as individual entities. So. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Steffi? Yes, so that's a great job, Alina. Um, I wanted to ask if the book that you based the article on um, is translated into English. Uh, I'd love to read it. And it, your your presentation was really appropriate given that it's Earth Day. Yes, thank you, Steffi. Uh, you know, I read them in French, but last night I wanted to have um, a copy. I wanted to have a picture of the English, English translation. And I kept looking and looking and I couldn't find one. So some of his books have been translated. It's, he's a, I wouldn't say a young author, he's a younger author. Um, but very well known in France, and some of his books have been translated, but not this one. And kind that's too bummer. bad because it's, I think it's one of his best. Interesting. You're lucky you can read French. <laughs> there you go. Here's, here's, here's the book. It's quite, uh, quite thick, and uh, we read it in the seminar I'm teaching, so the students read it too. Yeah, I think that's great. It's a great book to base a class off of. I teach a book called A New Species of Trouble by Kai Erickson that it has different chapters about man-made, human-made, man-made disasters. Um, but it's a great way to, to develop a class. Yeah, it worked really well. It's a book that plays with stereotypes also. Um, some of the characters, I said, you know, they move a lot. We, we don't get a sense that they develop as individuals, individualities, uh, kind of fade in the background and let their movements take center, uh, center place. And they're also quite stereotyped. So uh, the students picked up on that and they were quite uh, bothered by some of the stereotypes. And so it, uh, it generated great discussion. That's great. All right, bye everyone. I have to go do an interview for Earth Day. <laughs> it's a busy time of year. Yeah, Over. thank you, Stephanie. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other uh, questions from the audience? I don't see any electronic hands or questions in the chat. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Professor Cherry, for your paper. Very interesting. Uh, and uh, we have our next uh, presenter, uh, Lisa O'Donnell. Lisa O'Donnell is assistant professor in social work. Uh, her research examines the natures of functional and quality of life deficits, uh, such as employment impairments found among individuals with bipolar disorder and other severe mental illnesses. Lisa received her PhD from the University of Michigan in 2016 and joined Wayne State Social Work faculty shortly after in 2017. Uh, Lisa is a member of the collaborative research team to study psychosocial issues in bipolar disorder. Her paper is entitled A Feasibility Pilot Study, Assessing Attitudes on the Treatment of Mood and Anxiety Disorders Among Individuals in the Workplace. Lisa? 
Thank you very much. Um, that title is a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> Hearing you read it, I'm like, hmm. <laughs> but thank you very much for the introduction and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I, I'm grateful for the Faculty Fellows Award and, and the opportunity to share this data today. Um, and I have, I'm have going to start my timer so I make sure I don't go over. Um, so um, this is, um, yes, the title of my talk, which was already introduced, so I'll, I'll go ahead and move on. But what I'm going to talk about is um, some qualitative um, data that I collected to assess basically the feasibility of an intervention that I'm hoping to develop. And so what I'd like to do is give a little bit of background on the significance of the topic, of course, and also um, just to give the full process of, of the work I've been doing at Wayne, a little bit of background of the work I've done so far to help introduce um, the data. I'm gonna move through it quickly so I don't spend too much time um, before getting to the actual study that I conducted. So just a quick background. Um, so mood and anxiety disorders, which I'm sure many of you know, um, are two classes of mental health conditions. Um, that encompass different disorders within that class. So for mood disorders, some examples are major depressive disorder and anxiety disorders. Um, sorry, for mood, it would be major depression and bipolar disorder. And for anxiety disorders, examples are panic disorder, um, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety. And what we know about these is that combined, these conditions are two of the leading disabilities worldwide. So they have a large impact at a societal level. Um, and also the rates of these conditions are quite high, um, particularly um, in the US. And we've seen that they've substantially increased since the onset of COVID. Um, and this includes anxiety, um, depression, as well as both. Um, and, and what we know in terms of employment outcomes is that up to 65% of individuals with mood and anxiety disorders are unemployed. And this might seem very high to you. And I just want to remind you that some of the conditions within these classes are categorized as severe mental illness. And we know the rates of unemployment and functional outcomes are, are very high, for example, with bipolar disorder. And up to 80% of individuals um, experience work impairment. So although they're working, they're, they're having some challenges with their job. And so I want to talk a little bit about why I have a passion for this topic. Um, you know, what's the impact of un unemployment? Um, and, and, and specifically, what does this look like in the workplace? So many of us, I'm sure, can um, really appreciate some of the values of working, right? Money, that really helps that we make money when we're working, but there's other values that bring to it too, and I just want to explain a little bit of what those are. So first, again, at a societal level, we know that mood and anxiety disorders lead to high levels of financial disability worldwide, as I mentioned, um, but also that they're associated, specifically individuals with these conditions, um, they're more likely to live below the poverty level. Um, they're more likely to be financially dependent either on um, government funding or family and friends. Um, they have poor physical health, um, like less, for example, less access to health care and also a worse course of illness. So not only do they have the condition, but we tend to see worse outcomes over time as a result of unemployment. And lastly, um, which I think is a very important area because, you know, for me, I really value quality of life um, among these individuals that they they oftentimes miss out on a sense of identity a purpose in life um, and a status in society. I often think about the example of when you go to a party or a, or some kind of a social event or professional event, and um, people you know come up and one of the first questions you often get asked is um, you know what do you do for a living? What kind of work do you do? And just thinking about even that experience, if you're on disability or not working, how do you respond to that um, and how that can affect you, um, your confidence, self esteem as well. Um, so lastly, I want to talk about when somebody is working, what are these work impairments look like? So mood and anxiety symptoms, um, some examples are avoidance, which is really common in anxiety disorders, fatigue, irritability, difficulty concentrating. So we know, not surprisingly, that these type of symptoms can impact mm -hmm. job searching, job interviewing, and work performance. So you see these different transitions and how people might struggle with them um, due to their symptoms. Secondly, we know that these symptoms, um, based on prior research that I've conducted as well as others, 
that it leads to increased absenteeism, basically not showing up to work, or presenteeism, when you show up to work, um, you're not quite fully engaged or working at the level you normally would, decreased productivity, and even conflicts with people at work. Um, and, and we know that these consequences can then lead to job loss. Um, we also know that stigma is a huge issue. This is a big dilemma for people with these conditions. Do I disclose my condition because I have the right to, to get work accommodations? But they're often met with discrimination, unfortunately. Um, and this undermines their efforts to meet work requirements, to fully integrate into the work environment, and even to keep their jobs. So we know that um, there's a lot of issues that impact individuals with conditions in the workplace. So what do we know, what do we have now that's available to help these individuals? Well, as I'm sure you could guess from going with this, the, the unfortunate answer is not too much currently. Um, so what I mean by that is current evidence-based psychotherapies to treat mood and anxiety disorders. So these are gold standard, um, you know, shown to be effective cognitive behavioral therapy is an example, interpersonal social rhythm therapy, which is um, useful for bipolar disorder. We know that they reduce symptoms, but they have little to no effect on work outcomes based on the literature. And then in terms of work interventions themselves, um, some of you might have heard of individual placement and support. We tend to find this in community mental health settings, as well as vocational agencies. This is, again, a gold standard treatment. It's a very wonderful, comprehensive treatment, which is found to be effective for individuals returning to work with severe impairments in cognition and daily functioning, such as schizophrenia. So, so what we know is that IPS um, doesn't generalize well to individuals with mood and anxiety disorders that might be looking for different types of work than somebody with a more severe condition and also may di need different types of support that IPS offers. So overall, what this research, um, what my, the point that I'm getting at is that there is a need for treatment innovations that more fully and effectively help adults who are either looking for work or working currently with mood and anxiety disorders to basically help them with their work performance, gain employment and retain employment. So that leads me to the work that I've been doing um, and that I currently did with this, with this award. So there are um, a few steps that I've been taking because as you might've guessed, my, um, my main goal for the work that I'm doing is to develop a technology delivered intervention, um, an adjunct to, to standard treatment to help individuals with these particular transitions. So the first step is developing a preliminary, pre, a preliminary design, uh, it's always a hard word for me to say, of a technology delivered intervention, just based on prior literature, the work that I've done and, and consultations with experts in the areas. Um, so I'm gonna go through some of these steps, um, step two is when I get to the study, but I first wanna talk a little bit about the intervention um, that, I'm, um, that I'm hoping to design. So what this is, it's called WIT Work Interactions Training, and it is a modification of an already existing technology delivered CBT intervention called Entertain Me Well. And what it, currently it is designed for treating mood um, and anxiety disorders in general, but not specific to the workplace. So my hope is to modify this intervention um, to give you a little understanding of what this intervention looks like. It's autonomous. It's meant to be taken without any support from a clinician um, and anonymous. So somebody can take it, go through the training um, and nobody will know it's confidential. Um, so it can be taken you know, at home on their computer and in, in, in private places. So what this intervention does is it's a platform, a technology platform that engages users through a character-driven animated storyline. So you probably wondered what that image was of the little blue balloon. That is, um, that is Billy. And Billy is an animated character who tells a story about her own experiences with depression and how it impacted her work functioning. So it's meant to be a little lighter, although it covers a very serious topic. Um, it's meant to not be as intense and as depressing, but really to facilitate the learning of certain skills that we found that people may benefit from. Um, so these three skills include judicious disclosure of one's condition. As I've mentioned, the literature um, 
suggest that a lot of people end up um, choosing not to disclose their condition because they the, the ones that have have regretted it because they've been met with discrimination. They might've shared it with a coworker who told other people or people didn't respond very sensitively. So how do you choose the right individual to um, disclose to in a trusting, you know, somebody who's trusting and safe? Secondly, um, how do you request appropriate work accommodations, specifically what are your rights, um, your legal rights in doing so, and, and what are ones that would be useful for your particular symptoms? And lastly, how do you manage your symptoms in the workplace? So what I would like to do is um, I'd like to, so I want to give a little disclaimer that I'm going to show um, a very low budget version <laughs> of what I would like to design. So I'm gonna show a little bit what this story is. As I mentioned, Billy is a balloon and this will be animated. I'm gonna tell you still shots with a recording of myself and my partner actually, who are playing out this story, but we will actually hire professionals um, at the time that I can do this. But what this is, is this is a second scene of a story where Billy has experienced depressive symptoms. She is a librarian. She works at a local library. She has not gone into work and her boss has been trying to call her and she has not answered her phone, which is a common issue with somebody with depression. And so this is the scene where Billy com comes into work for the first time after this happened and meets her boss for the first time. And as I said, I'm not an actress, but I just want to give you a sense of what this would actually look like um, in a low budget way. <laughs> when I finally went back to work after not showing up a few times, my boss, Mr. Books, wanted to talk to me about what happened. I was pretty nervous and didn't know what to expect. Billy, I wanted to see you because I'm concerned about what's been going on. I was worried when you didn't show up for work and then you didn't return my calls. Is everything okay? So this is the next scene or Billy. So if any of you are familiar with the show, The Office, this is meant to be similar where it's a bit of a mock you documentary where Billy then shoots to the camera and talks to the camera about how she's feeling in that moment. And that's this is an example of that. So I did not know what to say to Mr. Books. I wanted to tell him I'm actually struggling with depression and sometimes it feels impossible to get out of bed and go to work but I didn't end up doing that because I wasn't sure how. Also, I didn't know if he'd understand. I was afraid he might think I was just being lazy or that I'm not cut out for this job. So- And then this is the last scene where she then responds to Mr. Books. Um, and as you can see, there's a bit of levity in this. We call it, The boss's name is Mr. Books at a library. We try to make it a little humorous too. I'm sorry, Mr. Books. I feel really bad. I hope I didn't cause too much trouble. Well, Joan stayed later to cover for you. Billy, I know you feel bad. It seems like you're having a hard time and I'm sorry. You're a great part of our team and I want that to continue. I just can't have you missing work like that again. What do you think about seeing Dr. Flate, a counselor with our employee assistance program? He's great at helping out employees who have things going on in their lives that interfere with their work. Yeah, I've heard about him. I've actually considered setting up an appointment with him before, but I never followed through. I really should reach out to Dr. Flame. That's a good idea. Thanks, Mr. Books. So that was just a brief demonstration. Um, I also showed participants the actual Entertain Me Well that exists so they can see what the animation looks like. But I wanted to show you some of the content that would be developed for this particular one. So this brings me to the study at hand, which, um, so the next step is, you know, so I have a preliminary idea of this, of this intervention is to assess the feasibility of it um, before, because I really would, you know, wanted to get feedback from people who would be using it, people who would be, you know, either using it for their employees or for the employees themselves and what they think about it. So I, um, prior to the um, Humanities um, Center Award, I did receive an award from the social work department. Um, and what I started with my first study was interviewing clinicians who treat patients with mood and anxiety disorders and patients themselves. So, you know, the audience that this is intended to target. And um, we recently had a paper published on this qualitative data. 
um, and which uh, in the social work um, and mental health journal. So that was the first study. The second feasibility study, um, which was, um, you know, which I was able to conduct based on the award, um, was to actually interview stakeholders. So these are individuals who might actually want to use this intervention. They might be a business owner, a human resource director, where they would use this intervention for their employees or even at a vocational agency when they're preparing somebody for the transition of going into work. So the, the aim of the study was to gather feedback on the acceptability, usability, and relevance of this technology-delivered intervention among professional stakeholders. And so um, what I give you a little bit of background on the methods of this. So it was, again, a qualitative approach. Um, our goal was to interview 10 to 15 participants. And, and um, just so you know, the, the next step, the hope is to use this content to apply for a federal grant to get the funding for this. Um, and so the idea is to get, you know, feedback on this that we can use to, to put into the grant. So 10 to 15 participants, currently we have nine, I'm hoping to recruit a few more. Um, the process has been a little slower, um, I'm guessing because of the pandemic. Um, I have 60 quality, we did 60 minute qualitative interviews via Zoom. Um, and then we gathered demographic data, gave a brief demonstration of the intervention, um, some of which you saw, and then solicited feedback with five open-ended questions. <coughs> So the questions that I asked participants, so again, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background on who they were, were, um, you know, how um, have you seen mood and anxiety disorders impact your employees at work? Like what have you found to be um, most problematic? Second, do the training modules seem relevant to the challenges your employees have had? Third, what do you think about an intervention like this overall? Um, and what do you foresee as the best way to disseminate this intervention? And lastly, what would you change about it? You know, what feedback would you, do you not like about it? What would you improve upon it? So um, as I mentioned, these were qualitative interviews um, and we um, are currently doing um, an inductive thematic analysis on this. So what I'm gonna show you is preliminary data um, based on our first stage, which is identifying key thematic content and just highlighting certain um, quotes that I thought really, you know, were really useful in terms of the feedback. So a quick background, um, just to, I wanted to protect the privacy, so I kind of, you know, made these a little bit vaguer, but um, we had a total, as I mentioned, of nine participants. Um, majority were female, um, a little over half were white. And the job types um, we had, oh, I apologize, that's cut out. Um, but we had human resource, um, vice president for human resource department, human resource directors, small business owner, um, vocational rehab specialist from vocational agencies in the area, and a workplace resilience specialist at a local university. Um, and so this is, you know, the type of businesses they were coming from, universities, automotive parts, um, very relevant for our area, um, metal engineering and production company, and as I mentioned, vocational agencies. So these are the individuals that we were interviewing um, who were experts and employees, um, and particularly those that have had um, mental health condition, you know, troubles at work. So I put together some the themes that we found for each question so far. And I just want to go through quickly and highlight some of the um, some of the feedback we received. So the first question I mentioned, how have you seen mood and anxiety disorders impact individuals at work? And not surprisingly, um, based you know on what I talked about before, that some the, the main themes were disclosure, um, symptoms and presenteeism and absenteeism. So for disclosure, this the bolded one quotes are the ones I was going to highlight. Um, somebody said, hmm, like people will tell you that they have cancer before they tell you they are depressed. You know, they'll tell you all about their aches and pains and ailments, but they will not tell you that they are depressed or that they feel stressed or anxious because of the stigma associated with it. And this is a human resources director. Um, somebody um, had said, depression and anxiety can manifest in terms of irritability and interpersonal issues at work. People might have difficulty getting along with a coworker or supervisor. Sometimes if people don't have coping skills in place for managing their symptoms, then any minor stressor even at work can seem overwhelming, which might lead them to take time off. 
And then lastly, somebody yeah. said in regards to absenteeism, that is the reality. If you don't go to work and you don't answer your phone, I mean, I've had that many times when people are fired. And this was in response to seeing the situation with Billy. So the, the next question is, do the training modules seem relevant? To remind you, the training modules are judicious disclosure of a condition, requesting work accommodations, and managing your, your symptoms at work. And so one person said um, this third line, quote, this tool is very timely because it provides virtual training at a time when people are learning to communicate more with coworkers and supervisors virtually. Interpersonal skills are becoming even more prominent due to the huge shift to the teleworking environment. And then somebody made the suggestion that the focus on skills relating to gaining social support could be valuable as well. Um, and so that is something we're considering whether that would be useful to include um, as part of a training module. Um, and what do you think about overall the intervention like this? So the themes we identified for this question where it was relatable, um, people talked about the animation, um, the need for an intervention like this and its usability. Um, so one person um, wrote for the animation, I thought this was a really important note that they responded favorably to it and they said, but they had some concerns, you know, that might be kind of more lighthearted and get their attention more. And then there's the people who are just very stern for lack of a better word. And they're going to be like, look, this looks like kid stuff to me. Why are you giving me this? I could see some faculty at a university thinking this is too childish. This is beneath me. So just kind of like whether the animation would really reach a wide audience. Um, and then somebody said, uh, this is a neat and interesting tool. A lot of people are struggling at work right now and don't know where to go. So these were, this was some feedback I received um, on just the overall intervention. Um, the next question or what are, what do you foresee as the best way to deliver this intervention to your employees? And I thought this was actually very useful because people um, gave feedback on a, a lot of different way, all the different types of transitions that can come up um, with the, you know, with the work process. So somebody wrote, yeah, so I feel like this would be very helpful right before you get a job, or even just when you're thinking about possibly getting a job. Then others thought this would be useful in an actual human resources department where you could give it to employees that are struggling. One person, I never even thought of this, said, you know, you could even put this on YouTube. Um, I thought that, you know, and this, think about the accessibility of that to a wide audience, which I thought was a really cool idea. Um, and then lastly, what are the suggestions about changing or improving this intervention? And what people said, the categories were um, the first one, supervisors, coworkers. And I, I've had a lot of feedback on this, which I think would be a wonderful idea. I can see a future version of this intervention for supervisors. For example, what to do when someone discloses to you or how to help an employee enter back into a team when they've been away. So having a separate intervention for you know, individuals in the work environment who are working with those with uh, disabilities and mental health conditions. Um, for language, some people said that they thought the language was accessible and relatable, but others thought, you know, maybe tone down the clinical jargon a little bit. So someone new to therapy might not have the language of how they're feeling, consider that. They know they have low energy and mood, but they don't know why. So they may not connect themselves with depression or some of the clinical terms I included. A um, couple last suggestions I thought were wonderful were try it, consider closed captioning um, for those that are, you know, hearing impaired. Um, and also um, somebody said, you know, the boss is a little too nice. It was a vocational specialist who said, you know, unfortunately my experience has been that that isn't quite the case that sometimes people will think somebody's being lazy. Um, and the boss here was very, very kind. So maybe toughen him up a little bit, which I, which does make sense. Being a little more realistic about what people would expect. So that is the, the overall, as I mentioned, the preliminary data we have so far, I'm excited to bring in more people and to put this together. Um, this is a summary, I won't go over it since I just did, um, of it. But as I mentioned, my next step is to apply for a federal grant. And there just so happens to be a, a call right now that is very fitting for this. So I'm excited about it. It's gonna be my work over the summer to incorporate a lot of this feedback to modify it and then also to include it in the grant as I apply for it um, as well. So 
Thank you very much for listening to my talk. I really appreciate it. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Lisa. That was very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Um, uh, I would welcome the audience. Yes, applause, applause. <laughs> uh, I welcome the audience to uh, ask questions in the chat. Uh, function. You can also use the reactions uh, in Zoom to raise a little electronic hand if you'd like to ask a question uh, verbally. I I hear typing. <laughs> Oh, I feel I feel a chat question coming. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have a question in the chat um, about your autonomous intervention. Is it online? Is there a therapist? Um, that great question. Also, hi, Michael. He is part of uh, the social work department. And I thank you for joining. Hi, Michael, thank you. I'm sorry I didn't mention your name, Michael. Oh, that's okay. Um, but yeah, so the idea is that this is meant to be like an adjunct to treatment people would receive already. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, evidence-based psychotherapy and medication. So this is meant to be autonomous. No clinician is involved. It would be available online. Some of the feedback we did get is maybe some people wouldn't be as savvy or comfortable using it online. And so kind of considering how we might address that, but primarily it is meant to be something somebody can just bring up on their computer or at a computer at a vocational agency and just complete it themselves. Um, and, and that way it's private. They don't have to talk to anybody. That way, if they decide not to disclose, nobody is the wiser. That's great. Can you evaluate it? Um, and, and could you elaborate on that? Oh, how would you evaluate it if it's autonomous? I mean, oh, if, it, if it's like yeah. independent and... Uh... Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, what we are thinking about so far, the team in terms of evaluation is um, confidence and um, basically people's confidence in their skills. Um, so how do they feel after going through this intervention? And do they have a clear idea of how they might communicate um, some of the interpersonal situations that come up that the skills are supposed to help with, but also to kind of rate before and after like what challenges they are having at work. So some self-report assessments, um, getting a sense of how their work functioning is going, how the symptoms are impacting it, um, and whether they have, um, they feel competent in using the skills. Well, this sounds, sounds great. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. Are there any other questions in the audience? Lisa, this is Walter Edwards. Is Hi. there any cross-cultural implications for this study? Yes, that, that's a great question. There's a lot of considerations um, in terms of diversity of culture, but also type of work. Um, culture among work. So this is a this is an issue we've been really thinking through and how um, how this might um, factor in. So for example, um, there there's a lot of different cultures among work environments where this might not apply. How do we pick a topic that's broad enough to reach different types of people and also different types of jobs? Um, and that's something um, I do have some feedback on that that I haven't quite analyzed just yet, but I'm hoping that will inform that. So to answer your question, I really don't know at this point, but we are working on that. <laughs> Thank you, Walter and Lisa. Any other questions? I don't see any hands up. I don't see any more questions in the chat. If there are no further questions at this time, uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Lisa, very much for your presentation.
Our next speaker is Professor Yunshuang Zhang, Assistant Professor in the Department of Classical and Modern Languages, Literatures and Cultures at Wayne State. Uh, she is uh, she received her PhD uh, in Asian Languages and Cultures from UCLA and joined Wayne State in 2019. She specializes in literature and cultural history of middle period China, circa 800 to 1400 Common Era with a focus on poetry and literati culture. She's currently working on her first book, tentatively titled Porous Privacy, the Literati Studio and Spatiality in Song China. The name of her paper this morning is Spatial and Cultural Transitions, the Rise of the Private Studio. Yunshan? Thank you, Vanessa, for this kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. So let me first share my screen. All right, so I think my talk uh, is so nice that my talk can follow Lisa's because uh, I'm kind of talking about how to relieve the stress and the anxiety uh, like Lisa just talked about. Um, so let's also start from the uh, the current situation, uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which has dramatically changed the ways of interaction between people and the spaces. From the perspective of the public and the private spheres, the pandemic has compelled people to undergo a retreat from public life and uh, to private spaces. It is crucial to construct a safe private space and to accommodate new contexts for professional and domestic forms of work, as you can see from these like samples of pictures. So my book project, uh, tent tentatively titled Porous Privacy, the Literati Studio and the Speciality in Song China, focuses on the significance of the studio as a private space for educated men. Today's presentation, which is generously supported by the Humanity Center's faculty fellowship, will present a clear picture of the literary evolution of the studio space by which to explore a double transition of the literature from the Tang Dynasty to the Song Dynasty, that is around uh, 8th century to 11th century. So I will talk about this double transition. Uh, first, the transition from external landscape to the inner studio. And second, the changing perception of the burdening private studio. It will open up a new analytical framework for spatial studies and for theorizing literary and as well as cultural transitions in middle period China. So the studio or study room in China is Shu Zhai. In Chinese, yeah, it's Shu Zhai, was an enclosed site specifically used by the literati for reading, writing, and artistic creation. Although the studio was often located in the residence or the garden, it provided a personal space for the studio owner to cultivate himself and to be apart even from interactions with family and friends. In China, there had been a long history for the use of the studio by educated men. However, it was during the 11th century that the literati redefined the studio as a distinctive private space. Not only did the physical studios become increasingly prominent and function as an indispensable space in the daily lives of literati, but more crucially, the literati constantly celebrated the studio in their literary works as an enclosed space exclusively for the enjoyment of ultimate joy and the cultivation of the individual self. So to demonstrate this evolution of the literary representation of the studio space, I would like to divide my presentation today into these three parts. So the first is about the prehistory uh, of the representation of the studio. And the second part is the studio as a hermitage uh, starting from the eighth century. And the third part is the discovery of the double meaning of the studio in the Song Dynasty from the 11th century. 
So let's start from the first part, the prehistory. A handful of anecdotes can help us to illustrate the early history of the studio in Chinese culture. For example, right, this is about second, uh, second, second B, century BCE. Right? Uh, it is said that Sima Xiangru, a scholar, Sima Xiangru owned a reading den on a mountain. And another, a little bit later, right, another Han scholar, Yang Xiong, had worked in the hall of drafting the super mystery. However, although these pre Tang scholars owned the studio or studio like sites, they seldom treated these sites as literary topics. We can trace the earliest known literary works that describe a studio scene to the poems of the prominent Liu Song poet, Xie Ling Yun. So it's about a fourth century. Although his poetic reputation comes mainly from his status as the founder of Chinese landscape poetry, concentrating on mountains and rivers, Xie Ling Yun also mused creatively on the studio. His poem, Reading in the Studio, Zhai Zhong Du Shu, is as follows, as you can see from the slide. But let's uh, start from the title. So it's so difficult uh, to translate the title precisely because we are not uh, very sure about the meaning of the Zhai uh, here. According to the reputable Wenxuan commentator Li Shan uh, in seventh century uh, from the Tang era, the character Jai in the title refers to the prefectural residence of Yongjia. A prefectural residence is the official compound of the prefectural governor, which functions as both his office and his home. After Xie Lingyun was exiled to Yongjia from the capital, he lived in the prefectural residence and composed a couple of poems on daily life there. These poems were later regarded as pioneering works of the subgenre known as poetry on the prefectural residence. However, the five officials commentary, uh, also a very uh, famous commentary produced about 60 years after uh, Li Shan's work, depicts the Jai in the title as a quiet room. Based on the content of the poem and these two early commentaries, it is thus reasonable to assume, assume the Jai as a room located in the prefectural residence, although nobody here clearly defined it as a studio. But it functioned as a studio. That is, it provided the owner a separate room for the joy of solitude, in particular, the joy of reading, as we can see from the title. So now let's read the poem. Uh, the first, uh, the opening, uh, two couplets reads as, in the past I traveled to the imperial capital, but never did I abandon hills and ravens. Let alone, I have returned to the mountains and streams. My mind and my activities are both tranquil and peaceful. These opening two couplets of the poem do not pretend directly to reading. Rather, they convey the poet's consistent passion for mountains and rivers. With a tranquil mood, beginning with the third couplet, the poem turns its attention to the interior of the prefectural residence, which is peaceful as well. So the next two couplets read, the vacant offices are cut off from chorus and lawsuits. Into the empty courtyard arrive birds and sparrows. Lying sick, I have plenty for leisure time. Brush and ink, I now and then take up. That is, with fulfillment of official duties and the need to recover from sickness, the poet is able to justify his enjoyment of leisure time, during which he indulges in reading and writing. The second half of the poem then focuses on the act of reading. It reads, in my mind's thoughts, I gaze upon past and present. While sleeping and eating, I break into mirth. I not only laughed at Ju and Ni toiling away, also I jeer at Yang Xiong in the Imperial Library. 
grasping the halberd can truly be wearing, ploughing and sewing, how could that bring pleasure? Mirrored affairs are hard to be simultaneously enjoyed. Fortunately, understanding life can be relied on. This uh, reading scene uh, seems to be relaxed, but as the poet often breaks into laughter while reading, this laughter at the Asians, however, is in fact a serious reflection on possible lifestyles. According to the poet, he laughs at Chang Ju and Jie Ni, uh, who are conventionally depicted in the classic Analex as model recluses. Um, he, he laughed at them because they needed to work hard in agricultural labor. And he disagrees with the scholar Yang Xiong because Yang, though merely holding a low official position, still inevitably involved himself in political struggles, which almost cost his life. In this way, the poet disapproves of the lives of both the recluse and the official. Seeking a better way of life, he again turns to reading. This time, he finds that the chapter Understanding Life in the philosophical work Zhuangzi holds the ideal solution, instructing him to comply with nature and to detach himself from external desires. As we can see, this poem is still best the thought of samples of the subgenre of poetry on the prefectural residence. Nevertheless, Although it didn't elaborate on the relationship between the practice of reading and the site in which reading takes place, it indeed initiated a new poetic possibility whereby the poet not only owned a studio or a studio-like site, but also began to show an interest in literary representations of the studio. But few other pre uh, sources echo Xie's appreciation of the studio. Only during the mid Tang to late Tang, that is about 400 years after Xie Lingyun's work, uh, some similar literary writings began to emerge. So now let's turn to the second part of my presentation, right? the studio as a hermitage. When the mid and late Tang poets mentioned the studio in poetry or prose, they were inclined merely to extend the detached affection celebrated in Xie's reading in the studio, whereas the, they largely ignored Xie's attempt to associate the intellectual practices of reading and writing with this space. One of the many examples is Bai Juyi, a very famous a scholar in the Tang Dynasty, Bai Juyi's well-known work, Account of the Thatched Cottage, Cao Tangji. In 816, after being exiled to Jiangzhou, Bai Juyi was delighted at the beautiful scenery in the Lu Mountains. So he began to build a cottage there. To immortalize the completion of the cottage in 817, Bai composed an account the part in which he outlines the construction of the cottage reads like this. Uh, for the limit of the time, let's just read the, uh, the lines in bold right, that I highlighted here. So it contained three rooms divided by two columns and two chambers with four windows. And then it continues to describe the design of the, uh, of the house. And then uh, it turns to the inside of the cottage. Bai says, in the cottage, I set four wooden couches, two plain screens, a lacquered zither, and the books on Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, two or three volumes each. The language used here stresses the simplicity of the cottage's design. The objects displayed in it include couches, screens, a zither, and uh, several volumes of books, which imply that the cottage, if not precisely a studio, is used for the poet's leisure in enjoyment. And indeed, 
by explicitly called the cottage a studio during his revisit in 822. The following paragraph of the account then describes how Bai enjoyed this studio-like site. Uh, he says, I lift my head to watch the mountains, lower my head to listen to the spring, and look around at the bamboo trees, clouds, and rocks. From the hours of Chen to Yo, that is about uh, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., right? Uh, there is no enough time to experience all of them. After I lodge here one night, my body is at peace. After the second night, my mind becomes cordial. And after the third night, I'm empty of thoughts and in a trance, though unable to understand why. It is worth noting here, rather than elaborating on the enjoyment with books and the zither that he touches upon in the previous paragraph, Bai immediately shifts his attention to the scene outdoors. From day to night, he is attracted by the mountains and the rivers, and his mind becomes more and more at peace. Thus, on the one hand, the account of the thatched cottage constructs a bounded, studio-like site by means of interior decor and the scholarly artifacts. On the other hand, the joys associated with this site are represented as derived largely from the natural landscape, bearing little relation to the indoor cultural space. The studio serves more as part of a reclusive space, allowing Bai to achieve his ideal of becoming a middling hermit. This tendency to treat the studio as a hermitage for the poet is common in mid and late Tang literary works. Although these poets took the studio as the poem's subject, which we seldom see in pre Tang literary works, they didn't endow this new subject with a distinctive new significance. These poems are difficult to distinguish from landscape poetry with an aromatic theme. The studio here is part of the reclusive landscape in deep mountains or gardens, and it is used as an imagery to express the dissatisfaction with the poet's public duties and to celebrate the delight of withdrawing from the turbulent society. It was Song Dynasty literati in the 11th century who gradually defined the studio as a distinctive cultural space filled with scholarly interests. The literary establishment of the studio with distinctive significance would have to wait until the generation of Ouyang Xiu. So now let's turn to the third part of today's presentation, uh, the double meaning of the studio. So through several works focusing on the studio, the celebrated and the multi-talented scholar official Ouyang Xiu and his companions made innovative efforts in shaping the studio as an enclosed space exclusively for the activities of reading, writing, and the creation of art, which developed to be the very symbol of the newly established literati culture in the Song era. By way of illustration, the following account of the Eastern studio, Dong Zhai Ji, composed in 1033, shows how Ouyang Xiu raises several key issues in regard to the literati studio. Ouyang Xiu begins by stating, in the east of the official compound, so we see the same as Xie Ling Yun, right? This is also in the prefectural residence. In the east of the official compound, there is a pavilion for resting leisurely. There are those who call it a studio, Jai, saying that one may dwell in idleness and pacifying the mind in order to nurture one's thoughts, as if one is abstinent, Jai, in this place. It is for this reason it is called a Jai. 
the assistant magistrate of Henan, Henan district, Zhang Yingzhi, resides in the district offices, and he also fixed up a studio space, a small studio. The opening lines, so play with the play on the term Jai uh, in Chinese. So Ouyang Xiu discovered that Jai carries a double meaning. Although the studio is in the form of actually a pavilion, people still generally regard it as a studio jai. This is because the use of the pavilion for dwelling in idleness and the pacifying the mind reminds people of the practice of being abstinent, which is expressed by the same character jai. Indeed, as one of the most uh, like well-known and uh, and authority like uh, a dictionary, right? Shuo Wen Jie Zi explains, Jai means being abstinent, being clean. This underscores the character's connotations of self-purification and mental pacification. When it is used as a spatial term, then the character uh, denotes a space for maintaining precepts and calming the mind. Therefore, based on the twofold usage of Jai, Ouyang is able to define the underlying feature of the studio as a space for mental purification. Following this, however, instead of depicting the studio and the practices that occur within it, Ouyang still wanders outside, introducing the administrative affairs of the district. So Ouyang describes here that although Henan, this district is so important, but it's very peaceful. So in general, the duties of an assistant magistrate are quite few. Consequently, Ying Zhi never worries about official duties, but is able to delight in carefree leisure. According to Ouyang Xiu, the district is at peace and thus government affairs there are not heavy. This seemingly digressive paragraph, in fact, justifies Zhang's enjoying life in his studio. In a word, the proper management of official service works as a prerequisite for self-enjoyment in the studio. Another reason for Zhang to stay in the studio, we are told, is that he is in poor health and needs rest. It says, moreover, Ying Zhi has long been sickly and emaciated. So it's fitting for him to have that by which he can dwell in idleness and pacify his mind. As for how the studio cures illness, Ouyang explains in the next paragraph in detail. So here Ouyang quotes directly from Ying Zhi, so Ying Zhi says, as those lines in bold, right? whenever my body does not feel comfortable, I choose either the six classics and the hundred schools, or works written by the ancients and read them aloud. And therefore, I'm so relieved that I don't realize that illness is with me. Accordingly, he abundantly accumulates ancient books and writings and stores them in the studio. Zhang's preoccupation with studying and reading in the studio brings him relief from his serious illness. We can trace this theme back to the seven stimuli by the noted rhapsody writer Mei Sheng of the Western Han Dynasty, so second, second uh, century uh, BCE. In that rhapsody by Mei Sheng, the crown prince immediately recovered from his sickness by imagining listening to the important sayings and the marvelous doctrines. Now, Ouyang creatively transforms the charm of ancient figures' words to the healing power of the studio. Here, the action of abundantly accumulating ancient books and writings and storing them in the studio is indispensable for healing. 
the studio allows its owner to read these Asian books and therefore to communicate with the learned Asians at any time he wants. After commenting further on this studio therapy in the following paragraph, which I will skip here, in the closing paragraph of this account, Ouyang turns his attention to the immediately immediate surroundings of the studio. So here is the closing paragraph of this account, which reads, by the side of the studio, there is a small pond with bamboo and trees surrounding it. Ying Zhi often invites guests to sit amid them. They drink wine, talk and laugh without weariness, even for the whole day. With a pond, bamboo and trees, a garden is constructed outside the studio. Activities in the garden, we can see, include day-long social gatherings and banquets. In terms of this depiction, Ouyang outlines a clear distinction between the uses of the studio and the garden. In the studio, Zhang enjoys himself, whereas in the garden, he entertains his guests. In other words, the guests are limited to the natural area and are not allowed to intrude on the studio. The Eastern studio is just one of the many examples of the representation of the studio by Ouyang and his literary circles. The principal characteristics of the studio Ouyang describes were shared among their works and were further inherited by future generations. Later works on the studio just adopted similar themes, imageries, and the rhetorics from these early explorations of the studio and at the same time developed and negotiated with them. So to sum up, this presentation traces the paradigm shift uh, in the literary configurations of the studio and demonstrates the pivotal role that Song Dynasty literature played in the cultural construction of the studio space. Scholars in the pre-Tang period had already owned the studio or studio-like sites, but they seldom treated these sites as literary subjects of critical interest. Only during the late eighth century did a number of literary writings celebrating the studio emerge. However, these early works often represented the studio as a hermitage that was interchangeable with other reclusive spaces. Finally, Song Literati established a new subgenre of studio literature, constructing the studio as a unique cultural space reflecting scholarly tastes and intellectual interests. A sharp transition thus occurred from the Tang medieval perception of the studio as part of the natural landscape for reclusion to the 11th century Song conception of the studio space as private but complementary to the public world. So that is my presentation today. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Yunshan. Another very interesting presentation. And uh, I welcome members of the audience to offer any questions or uh, thoughts in the chat or using the little electronic hand raise in the reactions tab. I do see one hand from Xiao Fei Tian. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, thank you, Yunshan, for a lovely presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it's very you know, inter interesting to see you trace the evolution um, of the studio uh, in representation, literary representation. Uh, two questions. Uh, one is that, so what happened in Song? Can you elaborate maybe a little bit on this, um, you know, contextualize this um, change 
that you uh, so nicely demonstrated. And the second question is, um, so what's, what's the implication for gender relationships? <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Professor Tian, for these wonderful questions. <laughs> yeah, and the very fundamental questions. So to contextualize the popularity of the studio uh, in the Song Dynasty, right, I, uh, I think the most important context probably is uh, the um, reshaping of the literati, right, the so-called Shi uh, class in the Song Dynasty. So in the Tang Dynasty, like, uh, like the, those scholars are basically also called Shi, but are basically aristocratics right, in, uh, who can serve the, uh, the government. But it's in the Song Dynasty that uh, there is a like, new type of Shi. So uh, they, instead of emphasizing on their uh, family background, right? They, uh, they pay uh, great attention on cultural cultivation and on their um, like erudite uh, learning. So I think that's so important that uh, they began to pay attention to this particular space. They put books inside and then uh, they can just enjoy themselves uh, of reading and writing in their studio. Uh, but other uh, like context or reasons for this popularity, I think, for example, the popularity of the print culture uh, in the Song Dynasty. So it was difficult to uh, accumulate lots of books right, in the Tang Dynasty, but that's come more and more possible uh, in the Song Dynasty. Um, so uh, that's another possible reason. But I'm still exploring like to make a comprehensive like uh, introduction about the uh, reason of the rising of the studio in the Song Dynasty. Um, and uh, the second question about the gender relationship, uh, that's also kind of a, a side product that I will work on uh, about the gender of the studio space because that's so uh, interesting and meaningful. We see that at the early stage, so uh, in, in the early stage of the popularity of the studio, that is the Song Dynasty, oh, I, is so, I, I can't find like uh, many materials on the, uh, on the female studio. Uh, so I, what I only know is that like a uh, very famous uh, a female scholar, right, Li Qingzhao, uh, in the transition between the Northern Song and the Southern Song, uh, then can share the studio with her husband. Right? Uh, but it's, it, it's good enough, like in the song, right? I can find this kind of materials. Uh, but if in late Imperial China, then we can really see um, uh, the uh, like female uh, talented like uh, ladies, right, can uh, have their can own their own studio uh, and uh, enjoy herself, right, instead of uh, in the in their own studios. Uh, like uh, I really got so impressed by the description of the of Lin Daiyu studio, right, in the famous novel. Uh, the story of the stone, right? or oh, we can see that Lin Daiyu's studio. Um, and when Liu Laolao visited her studio for the first time, and she, the Liu Laolao, thought, oh, that must be a scholar's studio, right? He, she cannot imagine that, oh, it's a female's uh, room. Uh, so definitely I will deep in, dig into that uh, gender uh, perspective. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. I look forward to seeing your book. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Shin Fu. Uh, what do you think some studios actually appeared in the text not located in true sites? Oh, yeah, that's a very interesting question, too. Yeah, so yes, uh, you are right that some studios uh, on, like only appeared in the text but actually they are not located in true sites. Uh, actually, I gave a presentation on this kind of uh, floating studio, right? Uh, I think a couple of months ago in Hong Kong. Um, I, I think that the video may be online, right? Uh, so I talk about the floating studio as a kind of a, a as construction of the studio, like in the in-between status. 
also in my research, actually, I also have one chapter just focusing on the imaginary studio. So I think that's perfectly demonstrated the significance of the studio for Song, for Song Dynasty scholars, because even though they don't have money, for example, or they don't have, uh, they cannot live in one place for a long time, they, they need to travel a lot, then even in this situation, they still like would make their greatest effort to construct a studio. And if that even does not work, then they just constructed a studio right, by means of literary writings or even just uh, imagined in their mind. Yeah, so this is really fabulous, right? We can see that only when the studio becomes so distinctive, uh, then uh, people can kind of perform, right, like that, yeah. So thank, thank you for you. the question. Yeah, um, we have another question in the chat, um, a question of translation of a term that unfortunately I'm illiterate to be able to read in, in the original script, but is there a particular reason, this is from Yi Yi Hei, uh, is there a particular reason uh, that this word that you might be read in the chat, uh, Yun Shuang, yes, uh, is yes, translated, exactly. translated as studio rather than study? Yeah, that's actually, I, I, I think about the, this translation of this key term, right? the, the subject of my research a lot. Uh, and thank you for the question. Indeed, yeah, I think uh, for lots of cases, actually study or study room works um, like even more precisely than the studio. But the reason that I choose studio, uh, there may be like two reasons. Right? So the first reason is that uh, some of my, uh, primary sources are uh, dealing with uh, the artistic creation uh, in the studio. Mm. And this is really part of the literati uh, culture in the Song Dynasty. So reading, writing, and artistic creation, this really shaped them as the erudite gentleman, right, uh, outside the court. Uh, so because well, I want to include that, uh, I decided to translate as studio. But another practical reason is that if I put study, like when people Google my work, I think they are, it's so difficult for them to locate my work on the study because study means so many different things. Uh, so I think studio, as long as I define it clearly, I think it should work. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good, good point, Yun Trang. Always got to think about those Google results, right? <laughs> Very clever. <laughs> um, we have uh, one more question, a uh, raised hand from a fellow panelist, in fact, Professor Cherry. Hi, Yun Trang. Thank you so much for, Hi, uh, for your presentation. Um, it's nice because I've seen your presentations in the past. So this is a variation and an addition to, uh, to my collection of uh, presentations by you. Um, I uh, really appreciated the way you started the talk with these images uh, from the pandemic, uh, because one of the biggest changes that we faced were um, uh, spatio-temporal, you know, our time, our perception of time has shifted dramatically, but also, um, even more so, uh, the way we we inhabit spaces and we interact with the spaces we inhabit or dream of. And um, it was so nice and refreshing to see how people envisioned the, the studio as this private reclusive space uh, that was meant mostly for, um, you know, contemplation uh, and uh, dedicated to the, to, to the inner life, you know, life of the mind. Um, and uh, clearly we do not have that anymore in the 20th and 21st century. Uh, the, the, way of the, the, the way our office, yeah, if we can call it an office nowadays, or a study functions is quite different. Uh, but I think we still sort of seek this refuge from the outside world. And it's a, it's a retreat where we allow our inner world to flourish, you know, through various activities as such as reading and writing. And I found that during the pandemic, this separation between spaces became even blurrier um, because um, with the use of technology, this, this private space became more open to, 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 to our public engagement. Uh, but I think it's become, uh, the, we, we witnessed an invasion of public life uh, of this private space. Um, 
not only am I doing all my, everything that has to do with public life is, um, you know, I, I perform it in the, the, this, this private space of the, of the studio, of the office, uh, but even activities that were relegated to the outside world, such as teaching, now have you know invaded as a as a, perhaps has a negative connotation, but it is the word to use because all these activities that were that are connected that are uh, linked to our public life are now conducted in the public uh, in in the in the private sphere uh, of the office Thanks. and. Uh, clearly, uh, I think this has a lot of socioeconomic implications. So I was just kind of following a little bit on Professor Tian's question on gender <laughs> with one on class, um, because I think class distinctions have become very obvious uh, through this use of the office during the pandemic. And I just wanted to see if in the text that you read, um, you see um, these socioeconomic conditions, the class distinctions, they define the use of the, uh, of the studio. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much for the comments and also the questions. And yeah, this is really interesting perspective, right? To think about uh, the blurred boundaries, right? In today's situation. Indeed, right? I think that's really a fantastic perspective to think about the boundary between uh, the private and the public which also I need to define it in my work too. Uh, so I think for the, for the social economic conditions, um, in, in, my, uh, the re, uh, in my like uh, resource uh, sources, I think, um, yes, I think basically in, in who can own a studio, right? In the Song Dynasty, I belong to the, uh, to the particular class of those elite members. Yeah, so only those uh, elite educated men uh, can have both the, uh, the economic support and also the, uh, the, uh, the like uh, accumulation of knowledge, right, to, to construct a studio. So only like in like um, late imperial China, so like the uh, 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 17th century, uh, afterward, uh, then we can see that, okay, the class is not limited to uh, elite members anymore. Uh, so that's kind of also show kind of the modernity, if I can use the Western uh, word here, right? So uh, in late imperial China, then we can see like a merchant uh, would like also like to construct a studio to, to, to show that, oh, I'm so like uh, well cultivated as well. And also like some clerk, um, can also claim that uh, I build a studio. I put lots of like valuable uh, artifacts and the books inside, right? C kind of used as a label uh, for uh, those non-elite members to, to, to elevate themselves. Yeah, so this uh, does not happen in the song, but indeed we can see it from uh, later times. Thank you. Uh, cognizant of the time, we do have one more quick question, if we may. We are doing pretty good on time, so I'd like to get this one more question that is in the chat. And, and again, pardon me for my, my own limitations linguistically, uh, but the question uh, is, what positive enlightenment do you think the uh, such and such culture, perhaps this is uh, the studio culture, I'm not sure, uh, among traditional Chinese, perhaps literati, uh, has for ordinary people in modern in China. Oh, amazing. You translate all the terms correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Good old <Yes>. context, right? <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, so thank you for the question. Uh, yes, I think like we, we talk about the, uh, the, the pandemic, right? I think uh, this really uh, give us an example, right? How, the, uh, how this kind of private studio uh, can benefit like, um, give us some positive enlightenment right to ordinary people in modern china yeah i'm i'm pretty sure that in modern china right people still like use studios a lot right in their daily lives and uh, everybody knows that oh this space is so important uh but um but we don't know when it's 
started, right? So my work is really just uh, uh, would like to trace back, right? To really show uh, the establishing process, right? Of this very, very uh, significant space in Chinese culture or even not only in Chinese culture, in East Asian culture at least, right? Um, how it evolved step by step and become so like, uh, still so uh, important and used daily, right, in, in East Asia. Yeah, so. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for the questions. Thank you, Professor Zhang, for your uh, presentation and answers. Um, moving on to our last uh, presenter of the panel. This is Professor Margaret Hull. Margaret Hull is assistant professor in art and art history at Wayne State. Um, she's also area coordinator in the art and art history department. She received her MFA in fiber from Cranbrook Academy of Art. Her current research seeks to destabilize the hierarchy between fashion designer and home sewer while increasing the visibility of home sewing in the public sphere via social media and culture. Margaret has had had work exhibited at the New Orleans Museum of Art, Cranbrook Art Museum, Wasserman Projects, and others. The title of her paper uh, is Cottage Core, Chintz and Persistence Through a Decolonial Lens. Margaret? Thank you, Vanessa. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm very happy to share my work with you today. Also very happy to be following Professor Zhang, um, who's, who introduced the idea of the studio and um, it relates very clearly to my own practice, um, but also my focus on bringing um, more, making more public activities that are typically done in domestic spaces. Um, so, as Vanessa mentioned, I, um, I teach in the Art and Art History Department at Wayne State. Um, I specifically teach in the Fashion Design and Merchandising Program, um, which allows me to bridge my interest in, in garments and clothing the body with my own education in fiber and textiles. Um, so I'm going to share the output of my practice-based research really since March of 2020 on the project Cottage Core Chintz and Persistence Through a Decolonial Lens, hereafter abbreviated to Cottage Core um, note spelled with a PS um, as the ending. I'm structuring this presentation in accordance with the proposal that I wrote for the Humanities Faculty Fellowship. Um, and we'll discuss my purpose in pursuing this project, its relevance to the theme of transition, um, my core research question, theoretical framework, methodology, and outcomes. To provide a very brief background on myself and my motivations as um, a creative person, um, I, as uh, Vanessa mentioned, I studied fiber at Cranbrook. Um, my undergraduate degree is also in fiber. And um, this specifically, this education focused on the conceptual, technical, and material implications of textiles. Um, fabric is also an inherited obsession. I care deeply about fabric's relationship to the body and our human relationship to clothing, where it comes from, who makes it, et cetera. I'm also interested in historical and contemporary applications and understanding of textiles, chintz specifically in this work, and I identify as an artist in dialogue with fashion, design, and craft disciplines. I offer some definitions here, um, definitions that resonate with me in application to my work. Um, I will not read them aloud, but offer them for your reference. So through Cottage Core, I seek to destabilize the hierarchy uh, established between fashion designer and home sewer while increasing the visibility of home sewing in the public sphere via social media and internet culture. The Humanities Center Faculty Fellowship has supported internet-based research, fabrication, and travel related to the completion and presentation um, 
most recently of this project in exhibition of my work at 621 Gallery in Tallahassee, Florida in uh, March of this year. Um, I apologize for the text behind this image, um, but the most recent exhibition of my work includes garments, photographic documentation, a virtual reality room, digital collages printed on vinyl, and mounted as wall coverings, as you can see in the right hand side of this image, and an installation of mannequins and fabric suspended from the ceiling. In this body of work and this exhibition in particular, I draw a connection to trends such as those promoted by various internet aesthetics and textile trade, specifically the way fabrics are taken from one place and popularized in another. In the case of chintz, it's a fabric that was colonized by European nations, England, France, and Spain, among others, from India in the 17th century. At this point, it is so ubiquitous um, in not only um, interiors, but apparel fabrics, that its origins and artisans are unknown or often lost, as is the case with many textile and other uh, traditional practices. The garments in this series of work are button-down blouses and blouse masks, which I'll show an image of in an upcoming slide. Um, these are scaled down versions of blouses that are worn as face masks. And I'll talk about the connection between um, the blouse mask and a face mask used as protection from COVID-19. These are made of a variety of cotton floral chintz fabrics. Floral chintz trends every few years, um, which cements its relevance. Um, it, it appears frequently in, as I mentioned, apparel and interiors fabrics in particular. I use this vibrant and varied as well as delicate pattern as a strategy of attraction while subverting its historic points of reference to collapse past, imagined and analog and present reality and digital. Um, this is this particular, um, the two images that you're seeing here are from the initial exhibition in person of work related to this project, which is at Simone de Sousa Gallery in Detroit in Mar or February rather of 2021. So this is a wall mounted uh, digital collage printed on vinyl and then blouse, um, two blouses and one blouse mask applied to the wall in front of the collage. This is a wall mounted blouse mask, um, which I have another reference of on the body in an upcoming image. I photograph the garments on people in site specific environments, for example, in cottage core look away, um, which is at left. The setting is a quaint domestic space. The model sits on a wicker sofa with pillows, which are consistent with the stereotypically feminized style of the garments, uh, which, as you can see, include pastel colors, florals and soft lines. I offer context through VR where visitors may experience proximity to others in a digital hypersaturated and 3D reality. Cottage Court espouses an es escape from the high speed present of the internet. Simultaneously, it's reliant on a network of online spaces like Aesthetics Wiki and TikTok to flourish. In VR, I create an intentional space parallel to a physical gallery exhibition that becomes a portal and a bridge between two worlds. I have a recording inside the VR room and I'm happy to place in the chat um, a link that allows you to enter the room um, on your own. Note, it sometimes does not work very well with Zoom because um, it requires a lot of bandwidth, but you can explore it on your own time. Um, and this space is a work in progress, which I will touch on later. Um, 
I had the opportunity to show one iteration of this project in June of 2021, um, the second iteration, um, where visitor, I was not physically present, but visitors could enter the virtual reality room parallel to the exhibition, which you could see, um, you can see to the left. I particularly love this image because of the bright patterned garments worn by the gallery visitors. So transitioning to um, the theme um, and, and this project's relevance to the theme, and just to back up a little bit, um, the world's relationship to textile materials has changed significantly in the last two years. We wear a face mask um, most often, some, although that's changing, um, when in public. And in the beginning, this was um, where available a disposable face mask. Um, but also in some cases was a handmade face mask. Um, this practice was not commonplace, at least in the US, until the pandemic hit. And like many others, I began sewing non-surgical face masks when there was a lack of PPE available um, to medical workers in the early, early months of the pandemic. I quickly connected to Facebook groups whose members shared mask patterns, posted surplus materials for pickup and coordinated mask deliveries. For a few months, home sewers produced masks um, and gained attention for their labor. In summer 2020, I worked with a group of students to make 1,200 non-surgical face masks for Wayne State facilities staff, which you can see at left. My individual efforts and the collective student efforts um, to sew masks fulfilled a desire to help while simultaneously bringing attention to the government's failure to maintain supplies for frontline workers. In addition, supply chains were disrupted significantly and overwhelmed by the enormous need for PPE globally. In the transition from commercial to individual small-scale production, I witnessed and participated in online spaces as sites for information sharing and community, whilst, which significantly influenced this project. Um, at right, you can see two patterns that I developed with instructions. The patterns were actually on the back side, um, but the instructions on uh, for two different face masks that I distributed. As the reality of the pandemic set in, millennials and Gen Zers increasingly turned to cottage core um, in response to isolation and doom scrolling fatigue. Followers of Cottage Core posted images of DIY projects on Reddit as evidence of their commitment to the aesthetic. Um, these are two screenshots of Aesthetics Wiki, which is an online archive and active resource for various internet aesthetics. I sewed blouse masks, as you see pictured here, in summer 2020 in response to the desire for escapism I witnessed in conversations online. The blouse mask fulfills a need for protection from the novel coronavirus while also acting as camouflage. Therefore, the blouse mask allows the wearer to disappear from the reality of the pandemic, particularly when worn in combination with the blouses. My project evidences Cottage Core's influence on dress, lifestyle, and culture during the pandemic to draw attention to widespread practices of masking, covering up, or otherwise ignoring injustices made more visible during the movements for racial justice in the United States and abroad in summer 2020. So shifting to um, my main race research question in pursuing this project, um, I'll offer some context. Lived experience is increasingly valued in fashion discourse and in industry, and recently calls for transparency in fashion and textiles have spotlighted the negative environmental and, so, um, and social impacts of these industries. Diverse bodies were more visible in advertising campaigns, and clothes that reflect the experience of people in these bodies are more visible too. Where previously conversations about DIY sewing would have been dismissed in more traditional fashion spaces, they're now welcome in uh, decolonial fashion discourse. Online sewing communities that operate on platforms like TikTok and Instagram offer valuable resources to their members, a value that has increased in the wake of the pandemic. My project extends beyond online forums and asks how can virtual reality facilitate community building and discourse about longstanding issues like cultural appropriation, 
amongst people who sew and or people with an interest in fashion and dress. Um, this is a fashion influencer um, who shares her makes on Instagram, um, part of a, a expanding community of sewers who share, um, share their work with the public and engage in dialogue with the public. Um, another increasing, increasingly available resource to people who are interested in, um, in garments that are tailored to their own body types, who are interested in sustainability and fashion. Um, MIVE is one resource that offers virtual reality measurement, body measurement, which allows you to take um, just using a smartphone, take um, images and upload them to their website. They send you your measurements and you can shop their collections um, based on those measurements. So it's intended to provide a more accurate shopping experience for consumers. So shifting now to um, the title of this project and offering um, more background about my specific practice. Cottagecore, a homophone of the internet aesthetic Cottagecore, references not only the particular movement um, or aesthetic, but also the commercialization of internet aesthetics in general, and the ease and speed at which trends spread in digital spaces. Cottagecore promotes a shift away from capitalism and toward DIY. In keeping with this value system, I sew garments using secondhand fabric sourced on eBay, Facebook Marketplace, and Arts and Scraps, which is a, um, an arts reuse store here in Detroit. Sourcing locally and secondhand not only supports the local economy and contributes to my understand, um, but also contributes to my understanding of place and people through unwanted uh, material and also lessens my environmental impact. Cottage Core's embrace of handmade fabric goods, including face masks, is visible in mainstream fashion as some consumers are transitioning from fast fashion to more ethical fashion. Meticulous garment construction and the labor inherent are often exclusive to fashion, luxury fashion markets, whereas mass market production of garments is fast and inexpensive. Through material, technical, and conceptual exploration of garment construction, my practice-based research aligns with the decolonial fashion discourse by critiquing a Eurocentric model of fashion production value and display that dominates the industry and education. Citing the output of my creative research primarily in fine arts spaces, which offer freedom and presentation and welcome multidisciplinary work, I initiate public dialogue on fashioning the body. These are images from my uh, most recent exhibition. Through questionnaires and opportunities for discussion, both in person and in VR, I facilitate critical responses to systemic social and environmental issues in the fashion industry among people who design, sew, buy, and wear clothes. Apologies, <laughs> I'm a cat situation. <laughs> Um, this is an image from the recent um, exhibition. There was an opening and also a gallery talk where I had a chance to communicate with um, visitors to the space. The okay. VR room was also set up in one corner of the space where um, visitors could enter the room. It was in the same space as the gallery exhibition. As much as I'm focused on contextualizing garments by placing them on the body, I'm also interested in dislocating them and questioning what is a garment? Um, what is its function when it is re removed from the body? So in this particular work, I have blouses installed on the wall, um, as well as collars. And then the curtain that you saw in earlier images is also exploring some of these um, ideas about the function of garments. Um, and what can actually be a garment. I'll talk a little bit about uh, my process. Uh, so I sewed the garments that were featured in this exhibition in May 2021 with the help of a studio assistant. 
And as I mentioned, I had the opportunity to show them in earlier exhibitions in June and October and then um, of 2021, and then reconfigured most recently in the exhibition that you just saw. Um, so I, I've worked with these mannequins for a few projects now, and um, they live in these large crates that get shipped off and it's um, a back and forth process to pack them and um, and ship them and I always wonder what my neighbors think when these large boxes are on my porch but it's a reality of um, of my practice and then also part of my practice is um, you know conceptualizing how these works will be seen and how they will be displayed so these are some early sketches imagining how I would install the garments and the curtain with the mannequins in the space I'm also consistently looking at the work of other artists and, um, and designers, and in particular, some of the, the artists uh, referenced here are working with a new, a term that is new to me that um, is featured or used in the title of an exhibition currently at the Museum of Art and Design in New York, um, Garmenting. Uh, this exhibition, at the Museum of Art and Design is curated by Alex Schwartz and she's bringing together, uh, so none of the artists here are actually represented, but um, she in this exhibition is bringing together artists who consider fashion and who critically look at clothing the body and exhibit that work in fine art spaces. So briefly um, clockwise from left, top left, Stephanie Siuko, Femke de Vries, Maria Hasabi, who has a, a dance practice, Paul Rucker, Jacoby Satterwhite, and Adam R. Performance. Um, so I often in studio um, consider other figurations, try on the garments as I'm making them um, as a way to understand how they're interacting with the body, but then also how they're operating dislocated from the body. The exhibition title, um, Washed and Worn, references the history of chintz and the dilution and its dilution from its country of origin, India, to European nations. The title offers also references the clothing aesthetic characterized by fading or aged prints or other deterioration after repeated use. I produced digital collages, um, some of which you see here mounted on acrylic. Um, and these in particular were made by um, taking earlier digital collages printed on vinyl, um, laying them out outside, um, manipulating them, photographing them, and then printing them um, and mounting them on vinyl. So I was very interested in the, or on acrylic rather, I was interested in this back and forth process between the physical and the digital, which mirrors itself in other aspects of my practice. The largest piece in this exhibition is titled The History of Cottage Core. It's a 27 by 11 foot wall um, installation covered, including a digital collage um, printed on vinyl. Imagery in this collage includes screenshots of chintz fabric that I've used throughout uh, these projects, um, as well as interiors and images of past exhibitions or installations. Um, this serves as a timeline and an archive of the project up until this point. Mounted on top of the wall collage are three balaclavas. Um, these are an evolution from the blouse mask, further obscuring the face and also referencing a recent resurgence of the balaclava in mainstream and influencer culture. Um, so these blouse mask or rather balaclavas are patterned um, and sewn by me. Um, the middle piece, this one is also hand embroidered on select areas of the floral patterning. Looking to outcomes and what's next, um, more recently I'm moving toward not only referencing internet based or digital life in physical form, but also the inverse, referencing physical forms in digital spaces to address our reliance on both. In future research, I will focus on producing garments using 3D fashion design software like CLO, um, CLO. 
This technology will allow me to develop digital skills that parallel industry progress while maintaining the process and benefit of physical creation in other aspects of my research. The digital garments will be available for visitors to try on inside the VR room that I showed you all earlier, offering interactivity and engagement. Instead of mimicking or replacing um, the physical experience of fabric on the body, digital fashion offers an entirely new platform for the display and activation of garments. Reliance on digital versus in-person communication during the pandemic has increased the visibility and viability of digital fashion as a medium. And my research will explore the potential of this technology alongside VR spaces as community centers to persist even after we have more physical uh, freedom in a post-pandemic world. And this is an image um, of a digital dress on the right. And this is just an example of what of some of the, the um, technical capabilities of this software. And lastly, I'm ending on a mood board of sorts, a collection of images I've made or taken um, recently that um, that have provided inspiration and influenced my recent project. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> I'm happy to answer your question. Yes, of course, we welcome questions from the audience. Again, you can write questions in the chat or use the reaction tab to raise an electronic hand so that I may notice you that way. I see a lot of applause. I'll give people a minute to uh, type any questions. That usually takes a minute for people to type questions. So we'll, we'll give a minute to them. Um, and uh, while we're waiting for any any questions to come into the chat, I, I would. Oh, yes, I see a hand up actually from Dr. Tian. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Hall. That was a fantastic presentation. I, I love the, uh, uh, the artworks, um, you know, you were showcasing in the presentation. Can you just uh, tell us a little bit about uh, more about the uh, the uh, installation uh, curtain? I, I just a uh, lovely piece. I just love to hear a little bit. Yeah. Sure. Thank sure. Thank you for the question. Um, so as I showed in the sketch, um, I had envisioned a wall that uh, a wall of fabric essentially that could be manipulated in a few different ways with ties and gathers. Um, so I had envisioned what that would look like. Um, I knew that I did not want to clothe the, the mannequins as I had done previously. I wanted to, as I, you know, as I described, um, dislocate them from the mannequins and show the mannequins as, as is interacting with the curtain. Um, but also at the time that I began installation of the exhibition, um, it, it, I did have to work within the space and adapt my original vision um, so it was very much on site, um, making decisions about how the different limbs um, of the mannequins would fit within the curtain. And it's very much, uh, you know, one iteration of that, uh, that installation. I think if I were to install the curtain with the mannequins again, it could have a completely different configuration. But I wanted to introduce um, ways that the mannequins could interact um, and, and kind of be on either side um, physically interacting with the mannequin. And it could also serve to divide the space. Um, the ceilings were quite high. And, and so I believe the curtain extended maybe uh, over 11 feet tall. So it also worked to separate the space, um, the, the larger piece history of cottage core from other smaller wall pieces. So it had a dual function there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? And your co-presenter, feline co-presenter was, I found their input most poignant. <laughs> it's very stubborn. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yes, thumbs up, indeed. <laughs> uh, and if there are no other uh, questions from the audience, I would, oh, I see uh, Professor Cherry, you have your hand up? Yeah, I accidentally put my thumbs up, which is totally <laughs> deserved. Uh, which of course I really meant to raise my hand, so. Um, thank you very much, Margaret, for, for this wonderful presentation, very visually stimulating. Um, I was thinking, you know, uh, it, it, it's very obvious to me that um, when I look at your work, uh, that you really, you're very much interested in exploring uh, fabric as, as a surface, as a space and also the interaction between the body and the fabric. And I was thinking back to, to um, my readings and this idea of decolonization and um, uh, the work that I mentioned today, A Thousand Plateaus. So this is not a question, it's more of a comment. It's a, that I wanted to make. Uh, they, in one of the chapters where they, they talk about the war machine, they talk about um, also smooth and stri striated spaces. And uh, they talk about felt and uh, how felt, you know, uh, how, how you can look at felt and include it in either uh, of these categories. And, uh, you know, looking at chins, and I guess there are so many things you can do with it. Um, I was just thinking for myself through their distinction between smooth and uh, straight spaces and uh, how maybe you can look at that and uh, see if it's any helpful, uh, if it's helpful at all um, in your work. Just Thank looking back at decolonization, because what they're trying to do, their, their project is very much in line with what you're trying to do. It's, you know, um, undoing binary systems. And, um, you know, it, it, it just might, it's just a recommendation if it might be helpful to look at it. Thank you so much, I will. Um, I took note during your presentation and so I'm looking forward to exploring it further, but absolutely thinking about the space that fabric makes. Um, that's something that I am hoping to explore and recreate in a way through the virtual reality room. I think when I first conceived it, I wanted people to be able to move through that space almost as if they were moving through fabric um, and moving through space created by fabric. So I very much appreciate that reference. And I, my grandmother, she used to sew. So I, I have people oh, in my wonderful. family who did that. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. I always love grandmother. And I still treasure, I still have uh, two, two, two pieces that she made that I no longer wear. I just keep them as museum pieces because I'm so attached to them. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Press Jerry. Are there any other uh, audience questions or comments? You know, as I think of the theme of transition and, you know, face masks in your presentation, uh, Professor Hull, uh, could you maybe offer just your brief thoughts on the afterlives of masks? I mean, as we emerge from the pandemic and the repurposing of face masks, and I mean, not that pandemics will will ever end or, or, <laughs> or not persist. I mean, face masks are always useful as face masks. Uh, but do you have any thoughts on the afterlives of face masks, uh, especially disposable ones, but maybe especially also the ones that are made out of fabric that are designed really to have a longer life. Yes, thank you for this question. It's, um, it's one that has come up. Uh, I teach a textiles lecture and we focus on, in the case of disposable face masks, we, um, we covered, you know, disposable non-wovens. Um, and we talk about, you know, the huge impact, the negative impact on the environment. Again, you know, thinking about Earth Day today. Um, so, you know, the huge amount of waste that's created by disposable face masks is one, one issue. But then um, the reality of cloth masks that are, we've been told are maybe less effective and, and mm -hmm. um, uh, at actually preventing spread of the virus. I think, you know, I don't know how many of you have, you know, a hook in your closet with how many, five, 10 face masks. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's something that I haven't given much thought to yet more. So I've thought about and talked in my classes about the disposal of, of, um, throwaway masks, but, 
you know, I could very well see a reuse project involving uh, cloth masks if they are if they're no longer really that useful to us. So I think there is a lot of possibility based on the work that has been done to make them um, at this point. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I don't see any other hands or questions. Uh, so I, uh, you know, this panel has been so wonderful. You know, I think it really illustrates the um, power and the capacity of interdisciplinary collaboration. You know, we have, you know, the humanities, social science, the arts, you know, uh, uh, represented here in, in such a um, fruitful conversation. And that really does show the potential for this any kind of interdisciplinary, really the necessity of interdisciplinary approaches to big questions and, and addressing big concepts, uh, which I think the, the theme of our conference transitions really help, you know, is, is an example to encapsulate you know, kind of a big concept or a big question. And those are the types of things that, that humanities uh, are always good at putting into context and helping to drive conversations forward and that an interdisciplinarity is really necessary to help address. So I want to thank all the panelists for their presentations, very stimulating. Um, it looks like um, Ariel had put in the chat that there will be some sharing of approved uh, presentations on YouTube at some point. Um, I want to thank the audience uh, for sticking with us uh, for the last couple hours and uh, everybody for managing the time uh, so well. And thank you all very much. I think a round of applause all around is in order. Thank you very much. And I propose a round of applause for our wonderful moderator. <laughs> thank she, you all. She took on this, 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 this job. I, uh, she's a very busy woman and a very busy scholar and a very busy administrator. And so, and she uh, was very patient with us and uh, guided us through a, a very stimulating panel. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor DeVisis. Oh, thank you, Walter. It was truly my pleasure. Really a great, great, uh, great honor for me. Thank you very much.